understanding that architecture is a creative endeavor and a business endeavor is, I think, critical. Business of Architecture, episode 362. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm speaking with Ox Architecture founder, Brian Wickersham. Ox Architecture are based in LA. They have won plenty of awards and they've got a, an eclectic array of different types of project typologies. They're working in high-end residential, mixed-use, multifamily, and a number of cultural projects as well. In this conversation, Brian and I discuss how Ox was born out of adversity in the middle of a recession and how he has led the practice forward and taken on all of those challenges and built a thriving practice in one of the US's biggest metropolitan areas. So sit back, relax and enjoy Brian Wickersham. Brian, welcome to the Business of Architecture. Hey, how are you? Very, very good. Thank you for having me. My pleasure, my pleasure. So you are based in, in Los Angeles. Uh, you've got an incredible portfolio of residential work in glorious, glamorous locations such as Hollywood, as the Hollywood Hills and Malibu, places that us in London can only dream of. And you've got work spanning in many different sectors with Orcs Architecture, which you're the um, founding director of. You've got work in hospitality, retail, civic arts. Um, so brilliant to have you on the show and I'm really excited to, to be talking with you about how you've grown your practice. So the first question is how, how did it begin? How did it begin? Uh, well, it, uh, it began when I was pretty young, actually. Uh, my grandfather was a contractor and builder. And so I always grew up around construction and architecture and my mother actually recently sent me a photo from when I was like 11 or 12 years old, like thumbing through plans on one of my grandfather's job sites. And so I was always around it. And then as I got older, I was drawn to the arts and painting and sculpture and initially studied that at university. And uh, I think as I was, you know, doing uh, studies and doing painting, I realized that uh, I needed to challenge both sides of my brain a bit more. And I kind of reverted back to, to what I knew from growing up, which was architecture, which for me was um, a really good bridge between the left and the right side of the brain. Uh, so I studied that in school and then moved to LA, uh, worked for Frank Gehry's office for a while, and then worked for a company called Daily Genic, which was a Frank Gehry spinoff. Um, and, you know, really through that experience um, and, you know, a lot of time working on some really spectacular projects, I realized that I wanted the challenge of starting my own company. And um, I think that uh, as a creative person, we're always drawn to see what we're capable of doing and what we can do on our own. And so more than anything, it really came out of just wanting the challenge of seeing if I could do it and uh, be successful at it. And when you first um, branched out into your own, because obviously leaving a, a practice like, like Geary's as well is, you know, that's a, a kind of dream location for many architects to be working on those kinds of, of projects. What were some of the earliest, what were some of the biggest obstacles that you faced in setting up practice? Well, the biggest obstacle is getting to work. Um, <laughs> when, you don't, when you don't have a portfolio, and you're starting out, you know, a lot of times people say, all right, well, what have you done like this? And mm. those early projects are really small a lot of times. I mean, at least they were for me. And so ironically, I'd worked on these massive, like super incredibly complex projects. And some of the first jobs were, we, we need to add a bedroom or uh, uh, do a master bath addition. And people would go, well, do you know how to do that? And it, in the back of your mind, you're thinking, yeah, I just designed one of the most complex projects in the world, but uh, I don't have a portfolio of residential things. And so yeah. it, it, it's a, it's a, it, was a, it was a weird thing trying to convince people with a portfolio of hospitality work and, and arts work and these bigger things that you could do a small project. And then ironically, as you grow through practice, you know, everyone mm -hmm. starts to forget what you've done and they go, well, can you do a bigger project? Because most of what we've seen are these smaller things. And it's a really funny transition that happens from, uh, we don't think you can do residential because we've never seen it in your portfolio to, well, we mostly see residential. Can you actually do this kind of project? And 
you know, in the back of your mind when you get asked these questions, it's always kind of comical because you remember when you had only arts work and people were going, well, can you do the bathroom edition? Yeah. Um, but I think that that's the toughest thing is uh, getting the clients, convincing them to do the work. And then mm-hmm. once you have that, you can really build on that momentum. And we always say that one project always leads into the next. And so we're always thinking not just about that specific project, but about how we rely on the success of the things we're doing to lead to the next work and the mm-hmm. bigger work and, you know, the more prestigious mission. Just um, going back to a bit of your, the experience that you had working with um, at Geary's, um, I, I speak to a lot of architects who have worked for star architects or big name architecture practices and then set up their own practices. And, and often there's a little, there's a little kind of set of principles or sometimes a little bit of business DNA that they take with them. Was there anything like that from, from Geary's office that you've kind of taken or some of the, particularly in the way that he, that the practice wins work? Well, when, when I was at uh, Gary's office, I was, I was really young. I think I was 23. And I think the biggest lasting thing I got out of that was I've got a long way to go and realizing that I had to have a lot of patience to get where I wanted to be uh, because there are so many incredibly talented and smart uh, architects and designers and and just really uh, a group of fantastic people. And you see that when you're young and you realize how much you have to learn to get to anywhere approaching that level, which is mm. a really rare thing. And so the, the last thing I get out of it is really just the, the, not just the relationships I made, but seeing what it takes to, to work at a really high level. And then mm. the, the place where I really cut my teeth was with Kevin Daly at what was Daly Genick at the time. And Kevin had worked for Frank for a number of years. And in a lot of ways, his practice was built like a, uh, a smaller version of Gary's office or what Gary's office might've been in the eighties or the nineties. And, yeah. and so that was a really fascinating thing to see a company that was growing. Um, you know, I, I think when I started, we were six or seven people and um, we'd grown to like 12 or 14 people. And then mm-hmm. in the six years I was there and, and Kevin really taught me how to be an architect. He, he taught me the skills that I needed, the, you know, I, I knew I had to be patient and in my time there is where, you know, his mentorship really helped me to learn, all right, this is what it really takes to do it. And this yeah. is the approach that um, you have to bring to it. Um, but those are all like just the experiences that it takes to get, you know, to opening the, the, the office in some ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, after that, the, the lessons, uh, it, it, it's astounding the things that you learn just on a, a, a an hour by hour basis. There's just so much more than I would have ever anticipated that you have to learn and you have to learn fast because, you know, I was exposed to a lot of design and, and you know, and, and technical architecture issues, but seeing how you operate a business, seeing all the things that go into, uh, you know, having a functioning successful company, those are things that you just can't be taught in some ways. And, you know, yeah. architectural education doesn't really set you up for that part of mm. Uh, the profession and the business. And so um, always learning is really, I think, the main thing. Yes. So in um, in Los Angeles, obviously you're in a kind of hot spot for incredibly talented residential architects. How have you guys managed to kind of take your sector of the market? Uh, well, I think the short answer is you fight tooth and nail for every opportunity. Um, you know, LA is an amazing place to work because there are so many opportunities. There are mm-hmm. a lot of people that are looking to hire architects to do really incredible things. Uh, and so we're blessed in that way, but it is competitive. You know, there are a lot of super talented uh, people working here. And I think that you, you just, you show to your clients at the beginning of the project or your potential clients that, you know, this is what sets us apart. These are the things that we do. This is the service that we offer that is a little unique from, uh, you know, some of our competitors. And, you know, initially you're always, uh, you know, kind of the inexpensive option. Like, oh, they, they seem really talented, but, uh, you know, they don't, haven't done a lot, but, you know, they, they're gonna be cheaper than these other guys. And mm-hmm. you, you transition from that, from being the inexpensive option to people starting to come to you because they really like what you do. And it's been really incredible to see in, you know, 
it seems like a really short time at times, but you know, in a relatively short time to transition from, all right, we're the inexpensive options, people are just really drawn to the work we do. And, and that's an exciting thing. It's exciting that people trust you and see what you do and just say, give us that. And it, it gives you a lot more creative freedom and a lot, a lot more responsibility too. It, it really, it really changes over time. How, 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 how many people are you at the moment in the, in the studio? We are 23, Fantastic. which is uh, a pretty uh, crazy thing to say out loud. Uh, it feels like not that long ago, it was me at my dining room table by myself, which I am again, ironically, back <laughs> at the dining room table by myself. It comes around in circles. <laughs> Yeah, it's and, funny how that works. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's it's 23 of us right now. Um, we've been uh, very lucky that we've been very busy uh, through the pandemic, and we've actually brought on uh, two people in the, the last several months, which has been wow. unusual to interview and go through that process and have mm. employees that you, you know, haven't met in person, which is an unusual thing. Um, but, um, you know, we meet frequently, we do the video meetings, I, we're all making the most of the situation, but yeah. Um, and, and how, how has your role changed from obviously, you know, kind of when you first started out to now leading a 23 person practice? Uh, well, you, you wear fewer hats over time, uh, which is right. the really great thing about it is when you, when you're starting out, you're doing everything, you're doing the business development, you're doing the invoicing, you're doing the design, you're doing the drawings. Uh, and then you, you gradually bring in help to do the architectural part. And as we've gotten bigger, the biggest change is that I've been able to bring in uh, the infrastructure of people and bring in people that are just better than I am at, uh, at things. You know, having, we, we brought on a director of operations and finance and having somebody that's focused on that has been a huge, uh, a huge thing for me because that's allowed me to focus now on design again and really stay focused on clients and the architecture because as it mm -hmm. turns out i was a pretty good architect it's great to be able to focus on that um but we have uh, somebody that's responsible for communications we have more admin support and so all those things are really incredible to have because um you you are doing it all by yourself for a while and then you get that help and you, you realize that None of these things are ever done by one person. It takes a, it takes a team and a lot of people, and we have a lot of really amazing people. And I'm really yeah. lucky that I've got so many people that are so much better than I am at so many things. Uh, and so my role, I think, has gotten a lot easier. Uh, and hopefully now is really kind of focused on the things that are important to me, which is incredible. What, what have been some uh, kind of the major milestones, would you say, over the last decade in terms of the growth of the business? Oh, major milestones. Uh, you know, it, it's funny to say it like that because I never really look at it as like this thing happened and everything changed. It's this really incremental thing that happens. And it was, I think it was probably six or nine months ago uh, before COVID, you know, I, I had been out of meetings and I came into the office and, you know, I was just a normal day, walked in and I looked into our studio which I remember when we had no furniture and one intern sitting on the ground making models. And I came mm. in and there were 20 people sitting in there. And I, it's just this wave hit me of, when did this happen? I, w w what day did all these people show up? And I think yeah. it's been a lot like that. I, it wasn't like this changed at all. And mm. it was all up from there. It, it's been this really natural uh, growth. It, it's been incremental, but I, I I think that there have been a lot of opportunities along the way, a lot of really great clients that have enabled that to happen. I have to share credit with all of them. It's been all of those things along the way that got us to where we are. And, uh, and a lot of the, the hard work of a, a lot of the people that have been in the studio for a really long time. Yeah, how, how have you reconciled the, the, the creative aspects of running a practice with the business aspects? You were saying earlier about how, how your role has kind of come you know, you're quite pleased that you're doing a lot more design as perhaps maybe uh, in some of the growth stages of the businesses you, you might not have been doing so much. Well, uh, I don't want to mislead the listeners. Uh, you never completely get away from the business, business parts of it when you own your own practice. Uh, so you're involved in those things. It, it gets easier because you have mm. talented people that are taking over more of the responsibility in that. 
but uh, understanding that architecture is a creative endeavor and a business endeavor is, I think, critical to every decision. Um, you know, the things that we do uh, in many cases, um, we do work in the whole spectrum, the economic spectrum, to from low income and um, a lot of nonprofit work to really high end things. But there, these things cost a lot of money and there's a business yeah. part of it. And so you have to understand that there's a direct relationship between the design decisions you make and a financial implication and a technical implication. And I think that that's the thing that it, to my, one of the earlier points that I made, that's the thing to me that's so challenging about architecture is that mm. it's not like painting where once you've bought the canvas and the paint and the brushes, you, you, you don't have to think about the financial part of it other than trying to sell it maybe later. Um, with architecture, you're making a creative decision and you know that if we're doing this, the impact to the budget is this, the impact to the steel is this. We, there's things that you have to reconcile and figure out. And um, I don't know that it, it is such a challenge because it's so integral to what we do. When we are yeah. designing, we're always thinking about those things at the outset. And one of the things that we do that I think has enabled us to be so successful is that at the beginning of every job, we lay out those challenges. Um, I think that one of the biggest dangers in architecture is that you can just say, all right, we're just starting without thinking about anything. It's just about the creative endeavor. We oftentimes say, this is our biggest challenge on this project. And that becomes the driver for a lot of the design. And mm -hmm. we found great success in that because rather than ignoring it at the outset, you're saying, no, we're barreling head on into this. Solving this is going to be what makes this project successful. And it's amazing how the design sort of pours out of like, you know, identifying the complicated parts of the job. And so really integral, it's really integral to our process. We don't divide it. I think that uh, design, it, it, again, is not just a single person drawing lines and say, make it happen. It's a mm -hmm. lot of people thinking about the complicated parts of it all throughout. And those are design decisions too. I want the best designers in the world making every technical and financial decision on the project yeah. because those impact how the ultimate uh, project turns out. And so those are really critical, important parts for us. How has the practice changed and adapted through entering into new sectors? And how do you, how do you balance that as a practice? Because obviously you've got a strong portfolio in, in residential work and you're also doing civic work and retail work. Was that a, a conscious decision to enter into those different types of sectors and how do you, how do you manage it all? Uh, it, it, was, it was conscious in that I always wanted to have a very diverse uh, company and get to work on a lot of different types of buildings. I just really enjoy the challenge of it. And uh, it's, it's always really amazing to get to learn new things about new building topologies. And so that was conscious in that way. Um, how we manage it is not so different than how we do our residential work. Uh, it, it, you have to understand at the beginning that it's about relationships and it's about people. And I think one of the reasons we've been successful in uh, other sectors is that we treat those clients just like we do uh, our residential clients. It, it's about a personal relationship. It's about getting to know them. It's about listening to them. And I, I find that we've been maybe most successful when we, we treat them like that. We understand that even though it may be a business endeavor, that personal relationship is really important and listening mm -hmm. is really important. And, and I find that some, and it's not across the board, but I, I feel like architects that have worked that are up way up through these small things and residential projects um, have a very different understanding of uh, how we practice and how we deal with people. And, and so that, I think, is kind of the key for us, and just keeping in mind that clients are the same uh, regardless of uh, the, the type of project that you're working on. And, and how is it split internally, the way that you structure the office? Do you operate like a group of small studios kind of within one hole or is it kind of like a rotation on different projects where you, you're sort of building teams as they as projects come in and and go through their ebbs and flows of workflow well as as we've gotten bigger and the the projects have gotten larger you end up having a slightly more compartmentalized uh, teams that have worked on performing arts projects are better mm. suited to, to work on uh, the next one because 
they have that expertise. But in order to have a well-rounded office and to have knowledge institutional, it's really important that you mm. expose your entire team to everything that's happening. I want the entire office to know uh, this is the things that we're thinking about on this residential project. These are the things we're thinking about on this art gallery project, because that is, um, again, to the other point, that's part of the ethos of the office is how we approach things regardless of what the topology is. Um, it gets harder because, you know, people are busy in exposing them to things is, um, you know, it takes time. But the things that we've done that have worked really well is that we have a peer review process that at every key milestone in the project, somebody senior, uh, independent of what their expertise might be, looks at the set of drawings. And so you're always getting a fresh set of eyes on things. And I think that that's really critical because you get so focused, you realize or you forget that this is really obvious to me, but to somebody looking at it for the first time, like a contractor or a regulatory agency, this might be really hard to understand. And so the peer review process has been really important and it enables you to have your, your senior people looking at a lot of different things, which is great. And then we've, we've started to do over the last, actually, and this is one of the successes that's come out of COVID is that because we're not in an office together and you can't peek over people's shoulders, we realized that what was getting lost was that just sort of understanding of what others are working on. So yeah. every week when we do our staff meeting, we have one of the teams uh, do and we we make the junior people make the presentation. We have one of the teams present the project to the office, and so it gives them an opportunity for public speaking and uh, to have their voice heard a little bit. But more importantly, it lets everyone in the office know what's going on and then give some input. Yeah. And it's incredible the input you can get at every level, from you know intern level on up on a project when you do it that way. And I think that people not only have really enjoyed just knowing more about what's happening, it, it's yeah. helped the work a lot. And so I think that as we come out of the uh, the work from home situation and we're back into a normal studio environment, that's something that we're going to maintain. It, it has been one of the most successful things that's come out of, of all of this. It's weird with the Zoom meetings, but um, it's going to be great when we're starting to do it in person. Well, it's, it's really interesting how, you know, the as the as practices grow and evolve and you said you know the kind of institutional knowledge that you're kind of keen to retain because people have got different ideas and different uh, approaches um, and obviously facilitating dialogue amongst design teams and having people become aware of each other and what they're doing is absolutely is absolutely critical how, how is this is that very much um you know the kind of the building of the ethos and the culture um, how else do you go about doing that? Or how is it something that you've kind of consciously, do you sit down with, with other directors and consciously design that? Or has it kind of happened organically? It, it's happened organically. Um, I, and again, it's just like the growth of the company. You don't, mm. when you're two people, you don't think about, all right, how do we make sure everyone knows what's going on? But at a certain point, there's enough people that uh, all of a sudden, uh, there might be somebody that has no idea the other things that are happening in the office. And so we, we are very conscious of it now. It's very important to me uh, culturally for the office that everyone is, that feels invested in everything that's happening because there's a lot of times where the thing that you're working on might not be the most glamorous uh, thing in the office, but it's critical to the office as a whole. And so yeah. I talk about it a lot with the team that even if the thing you're working on feels like it, it's, the, the dog or whatever it might be, there's something that that's doing for us that's enabling um, these other things to happen. And we're all part of that effort together. It's not about individual projects. It's about the trajectory of the team and of the studio together. And yeah. the it, team effort is important and it helps us through when, you know, somebody is, you know, the one that has to go down to the city and, and fight it out over, you know, plan check correction or something that's not so glamorous or fun. But, you know, those those tasks have to be done. Sometimes you have to do the dishes. None of us yeah. can avoid that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, building a team is so important to me. It's actually one of the things I enjoy most about mm. being in a leadership role is, is mentoring and teaching and facilitating the things that we do. Yes. And it's so incredible to see people grow, especially when they've been with you for a long time. 
that mm. you see those aha moments and it, it, there's there's a lot of satisfaction that comes from that well that's um really good to hear actually you use the word mentorship there and and leadership in the same sentence um and how important those two things are you know how they work together a lot of people don't don't lead like that or they develop cult business cultures which are um not so not so nurturing in terms of being a a good mentor to to your team and and establishing like an ethos and a culture of of mentorship how do you how do you embody that or how do you kind of cultivate it i think that one you look at everyone as an individual that you okay. see the things that uh, they bring as assets, you see the things in them that maybe they don't see and you try to foster them. Uh, I think more than anything, you just communicate with people uh, and, and really you communicate frequently and you make sure that you understand uh, not just what they're doing on a daily basis, but what their goals are and you know, what do you want to get out of this? And what I found is that when you're, when you're supporting people and you're letting them explore and like look into the things that really interest them, we get a lot more out of it. We routinely send people um, for educational opportunities and they, they pay for themselves tenfold and the enthusiasm and the knowledge coming into the studio and just giving people those opportunities uh, I think is, is critical. Uh, people mm. work really hard in our studio and we want to reward them. We want them to know that what they're doing is important and, and that they're part of this, that it's not just they're filling a role. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's all about just seeing the individuals working with them, knowing that the people, you know, we pay for software and infrastructure and all these things. The biggest investment we make is into the people and yeah. teaching them how to do it right is the smartest thing that that you can do as a business owner is take the time be patient again to the beginning you got to have the patience because not everyone's mm. going to know it overnight but once they learn it they can work more autonomously they can take your ideas they can take uh the the sort of knowledge of how we do things in the office and expand on the work and then that way it's like jazz like you lay down a track and then somebody comes in with the sax and they, they lay down something different and then the guitar. And, and that's mm. what we really try to do is we, we let people know that ideas can come from everywhere, from every level. Everyone is encouraged to contribute. And as a result of that, I think we get a really rich set of new ideas within the context of what we do. But we also get people that I think really enjoy what they're doing. Uh, and it's important to me that we have a really good work environment and mm. and i think that uh there are a lot of businesses at, in all sectors that uh aren't like that and yeah. it's important to me that we have a really good place for people to come and work because i have to go in there too i want people to well we used to <laughs> i can't <laughs> um but, you know, but what's the, what's the point if you're going into a place where everyone is miserable you, yeah. working in a good environment where people are happy and enjoying what they're doing and feel like what they're doing is important makes mm. it better for me too and so selfishly i get probably way more out of it than anyone else having that environment and having those really great people around me and, and and as the business begins to expand um how how does your sort of your human resource strategy evolve well the first step is you develop the human resource strategy uh <laughs> which again you don't usually have at the beginning Um, it, it gets, it gets more professional and you, you start to do the things that, uh, are easily ignored when you're smaller. Uh, so you build the infrastructure just like everything else. Uh, you, uh, you put in place all the stuff you have to do, office manuals and that thing, but it really comes down to people. And as long as you treat people fairly and you keep at the core, those things that made you great when you were smaller, that's, that's the key to me. Yeah, we have an HR department now. We have an HR like, like manual and all that stuff. But the manual doesn't mean anything. If when yeah. somebody asks for something, you say, you know, you have to read the manual. You have to look at the yeah. situation and go, this person's struggling with something or needs to go uh, take care of something, but they don't have the accrued time. You don't sweat mm-hmm. that stuff. It's more important mm-hmm. that you say, you know what, we'll work with you. We'll help you out. 
I, I, the HR manual is, is there for a reason, but it's really more about how you personally interact with people and treat people and, and, and foster a really good environment. Um, I think beyond anything. And, and where, where do you think this humanist, so this kind of human, this humanist centric uh, culture came from? Is it something very much that's of your personality or has it been consciously developed? Uh, well, I guess I could thank my mother. I, I don't know where, <laughs> uh, where it comes from. It, it comes a little bit out of me. Um, I think, uh, it comes a lot from my experiences and, in the mm-hmm. things that I've seen along the way and the, the things that I've been exposed to in other places. But um, it, I don't know if it's been a conscious one as much as it is that um, it, it's kind of rooted in, in making my own personality. Um, the small companies are a, in a lot of ways a, a, a function of the personality of the person that started it. Um, but uh, it's also, I think, grown and gotten better because of the people that I bring in, they yeah. share those core values. And when we bring in, especially, you know, senior people, the way that we evaluate them is a lot less about their technical ability. Although, you know, experience is important. Uh, it's about, do they, do they meet our, our core values of the company about communication and personality and, and mm-hmm. the way that we treat people and approach work and are they passionate about design and, I'm far more successful when I gauge people based on the core values than I am on their technical abilities. Because in an hour long interview, somebody can bring in a set of drawings and say, yeah, I did every single one of these details. And even though I know that's probably not true, you take people (laughs) at the value of what they've said and and, uh, face value what they said. Uh, But when you say, all right, does this person share uh, our drive for design? Do they communicate the way that we want people to communicate clear and concise? Mm -hmm. And when you start to look at that, we have way better, way better success hiring Mm -hmm. in that way. And then they share your ethos and they are going to grow with you and, and, and believe in the things that you're doing. And so that's, and that's kind of been our recipe. Um, There's, you know, like anything, there are failures along the way but you learn from those. And then that's mm-hmm. how you know, like, this is where we've been successful. And, you, and I think you have to, to succeed in any business. I think you have to have a short memory. You have to be able to forget the last pitch, so to speak, but you also need to be able to look back and learn from uh, failures and successes mm-hmm. in, at all levels. And so, uh, yeah, I think that it's been a little bit of trial and error, but uh, now I think we've got a pretty good system for recognizing what, what, how we what, keep the ethos in place. What, what have been some of the biggest lessons that you've learned? And what, the, <laughs> and, what, and, what, and what were the experiences that led to them? If you're able the, to divulge. The, uh, oh, uh, well, generally speaking, yes. Uh, the biggest lessons have been when we haven't communicated clearly. And I think that um, when I look back at where we've had issues and things, almost always it was that we weren't as direct or as concise or as clear as we needed to be. And avoiding issues, so much of it is just being open and talking and telling people what the situation is. And, And that's also how you establish trust and that's how you are successful in any endeavor. Um, and so I, I think that's one of the biggest lessons, just always being clear and more communication is always better. Um, there have been many technical lessons along the way. There have been many lessons about uh, uh, not maybe focusing on that. Uh, actually, let me say it another way, uh, learning what's important to focus on. And yeah. I think a lot of times as architects, we get really caught up in the minutia or in detail and what you really have to do is step back at times and say, you know, that might be important, but what's the bigger picture? What's the more important thing? And I think I've gotten much better at being focused on the big picture. In the grand scheme of things, we might not get everything we hoped for out of this particular detail or project or thing, but the trajectory is putting us in the right spot. And it's, it's, easier for me to do that because I see everything that's happening and I know that we maybe don't need this here. Uh, the more important thing is that this other thing happens. 
And, uh, and so, yeah, not getting too caught up in the details, uh, knowing that you're playing the long game is another part of it. It's really easy yeah. to get caught up in the moment and you just can't do that. The things that we do take a long time. I have projects that are in construction right now that started when I was sitting by myself at the dining room table. Again, wow. Sitting at the dining room table by myself. Um, and so, you know, these things take time. It, and, yeah. and so you have to be super patient and you have to know that uh, you, you're going the right way. That uh, over the long haul, we're, we're, we're doing what we want. We're moving in the direction we want to. And, and so, yeah, that's just perspective. And I think it's a lot of uh, experience and uh, uh, kind of old guy wisdom that you pick up along the way. <laughs> how, how, do you, how do you assess the success of your projects? Boy, that's a hard question. Um, it's, it's a little bit of what I just said, sort of stepping back and saying, this is uh, sending us in the right direction. Um, yeah. A lot of times you find the successes and things that you didn't anticipate. Uh, a lot mm. of times um, there are there are things that you toil over on projects, details, um, spatial relationships that you think are the most important thing. And you'll make just a throwaway decision, just like, oh, I'll just do this over here. I'm not going to think about it much. And that'll be the most spectacular thing in a project. And so I think you have to uh, forget your preconceived ideas a lot of times and just look at it um, as the lessons that you've learned along the way. Um, it, evaluating your own work is something that architects probably shouldn't do. Um, but we're forced into it at times and like you, you have to learn from your, uh, the things that you've done, but, uh, yeah, I don't, I actually don't know how to answer that other than you just kind of, uh, go through the cycles of, I love it. I hate it. I love it. I hate it. And then you grow to <laughs> sort of learn from it. In, it. As the practice has started to be involved in, in, differing sectors um are are those movements into other sectors is that do you kind of make concerted efforts of like right we really want to do a kind of civic arts project uh, and you go after them and you either enter competitions or how do you go about moving into new sectors uh you you, you be very opportunistic that when right. those opportunities present themselves which is rare it, it, it's hard for those things. They don't pop up that often, but when they mm. do, you go 100%. You, you chase them with everything that you've got. You work harder. You focus more. Um, and that's what it takes because there are a lot of really talented people that have done a lot more of everything than you have. And so the only way that you can get those projects is to show that you're more passionate about it. You care about it more. You're, mm. you're more focused on it. You're going to get the attention that you might not get from a, a, another company. And it, that sort of determination, I think, is really important. I, I mean, I wanted to move into other sectors I, for, again, many reasons. But um, it's, hard, it's hard to say, I want to do performing arts projects and then chase those around. You, you see that there's that opportunity and you go after it. And um, we've been very lucky, and but it's been, been it's, it's been a lot of hard work, and it's been a, a lot of investment of your own time and, and really resources to do it. The, the first one of anything is always more complicated. The second yeah. one is substantially easier. And it just, it starts to become second nature. Like you can lay out a, a suite with your eyes closed after you've done it enough times, but the first time you do uh, a you know, a, a performing arts building or a, a theater space, you have to take the time and learn how to do it. And that does take more resources. And so you have to sort of look at it as this is an, inve an investment uh, in moving into another sector, but it's also an investment in that, again, that institutional knowledge. And um, it's, it, it, it's, it's hard, but, you know, you, you fortify that effort through successes in other sectors and, uh, capital from other things that you're doing, but that's that's been our recipe. I think that there's a lot of other ways to do it. We've never uh, relied on competitions. That's just not been um, what uh, what we needed to do or what we've done. Uh, our our success and the growth has really come from the success of that project led to this one. Uh, mm. Being good to your clients, being fair, uh, and getting the recommendations. 
um, from the people that you're working with in the moment. And, and that's really all of our growth. Our first performing arts project came out of a house project that didn't get built. But wow. that client, even though the project didn't happen, he respected how we dealt with it, which was we've got it this far, but you know, you're, what you're trying to do, it just doesn't align with your budget or other things. And you just, we were really honest with them and, and, and they always appreciated that. And, and so when somebody came to him and said, Hey, we're thinking about doing this performing arts project. Can you recommend somebody? Mm. He said, that list that you've got is super impressive. And I recognize every single one of the names on it, but I think you should try out this other company. They haven't done this, but I think you're going to respond to the way they approach a problem in a project. Yeah. And so uh, you, you just, you're only as good as the last thing you did. And you, you have to realize that it's a relationship business and it doesn't matter how big or small the project is that could lead to something uh, down the road and you just treat people that way. How do you know when to say no to a project? It's hard. Um, it, it's actually, I think one of the toughest skills to learn because, you know, I started the company in 2008 mm. and as you might remember, that was a precarious time in our Bleak industry. times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, I survived by just being willing to do just about anything. You know, there was no project too small or too complicated because um, I, I needed that to, to grow and to succeed. And so that was baked in a little bit into a long time. And so saying no to things, it's, it's hard. When you came out of a time where there wasn't a lot of opportunity, it's hard to say, yeah, we're just, we have to pass on it. But, um, but what starts to happen is you, you look at projects and say, does this meet our, our criteria for the things that we do? Much like with hiring people, does it meet our core values? Do these clients want to do something that's aligned with what we want to do uh, aesthetically? Is it a, a potential financial center for the office? Is this mm -hmm. a client that uh, is going to uh, progress the office because of the connections that they may have? And, um, and you start to look for more of those things. It used to be maybe that it was just like, all right, just an opportunity and it's money, we'll take it. You know, when you're again by yourself and just trying to make ends meet. To, yeah. you know, now we need two of the three things or when you get really busy, you know, do we have three of the three things aligning? And, um, and that's how you gauge it. You know, it, it, does this advance our goals? And it's, I think it, it's a personal business, especially um, on the residential side of things. So you want to make sure that you're aligned. And so what I've found that has worked best is not so much saying no to things, but being very sincere and very honest with people. This is how we work. These are the things that we do. Um, is that going to be something that you're going to be okay with? And that is that, does this align with what you want? And yeah. I think that that works better than anything. But are, are we aligned? Because this is a, a very personal complicated expensive endeavor at times um are we on the same page and it's a most marriage times people it is and it's a marriage that will last longer than a lot of real marriages you know <laughs> these things again take a lot of time i mean years years and years of of yeah. effort in 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 very intimate too i mean mm. especially on the the single family residential work you're talking about how people live you're talking about their relationships. You're talking about their families. I mean, it's and and that takes time. To, to, you you don't start in meeting one with, uh, all right, let's talk about your uh, your bathroom behaviors. Like you 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 work your way up to the 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 more intimate parts of a project, and um in you you have to invest that time so you can give them what they really want because they have to mm -hmm. trust you before they're going to talk about those other things and. And again, that just leads into uh, the other sectors that you understand that you have to make the investment in time and getting to know people so they trust you. And once that trust is there, that's where all of the success really happens. And yeah. you, you get good at recognizing the things you need to do to get people to, to believe in you and to trust the things you're doing. And uh, again, it, it has gotten easier because you can take people to your projects and they can see it and they feel it. And that response and people seeing that and feeling those spaces makes it so much easier because you can say, 
this is what we're trying to do for you. We want you to have this feeling uh, mm -hmm. or this materiality that you saw in this other project. We want to do something like that for you. And that's something that you don't have at the beginning of a, a practice, but it, we really rely on. And that's another reason you stay really close to your clients. So you can always take people through the projects and they can mm -hmm. see and, and more importantly, feel what it's like to be in our spaces because our work tends to be a lot about the the shifting of volumes it, moving from uh compressed spaces to expansive spaces and in that leading you through a project and then it's really about how light comes in and materiality and, and you know a lot of people will say to us you know we love modernism we just don't like how cold it is and so when yeah. people can go to our spaces and see how warm and full of light they are and the, the, that that feeling that comes out of it it's it's so different than just like well we did these renderings or these are drawings you you, you can't you're missing a part of it that w that we have now and and it mm -hmm. does help us a lot in uh, in building up that relationship with our clients and the trust the, that we in, can do it in the in the residential market um, how have you, you you were saying earlier you know sometimes your you know your client with, on a residential project the project wasn't realized but was was impressed with the approach that you'd been establishing and it led to working another sector um with the residential clients how have you how do you manage to kind of get repeat business because this is something that often a lot of residential practices either struggle with it's a one-off it's a big investment from a from a client do you have you worked with um developer clients or or is it ref, or referral based or how how have you managed to grow that that sector that part of the business? It's almost all referral. Um, right. all, I would say ninety five percent of our clients came from another client recommending it, and you can't replace that. The yeah. people people are going to bat for you because they know the people they're recommending you to, and they say, you know, I think for you this person would be great. Um, we've had a couple. Uh, people just drive by our projects and respond to them and call the construction sign. Um, that's a little more rare, but it does happen. Um, but it's really been a, it's a referral based thing. And I think mm. that it, that's just, it's why it's so important to really focus on your clients and yeah. making sure you have a good relationship and them seeing that you're always fighting for their interest because, you know, an architect's interests are most times aligned with that of their client. They want the project to be successful from a design perspective. They want it to be successful from a financial perspective. And there are a mm -hmm. lot of forces that work against that, but your client seeing you that you're fighting for those interests is the best thing you can do. And that's how they, they, they see that, and that's what really gets the recommendation. Mm -hmm. We've had a, a few times where we interviewed for a project, and I was, just, I was really honest in the interview and said, I, I just don't, I don't know if what you're trying to do is going to work. And, and other people, we didn't get that job, but other people said, oh yeah, we can make it work. It's going to work. And then, you know, six months, a year later, you get a, a message from the person and they're introducing you to somebody else and saying, we didn't, this isn't who we worked with, but this is who we should have worked with. This is who you should work with. And so it's, it, it's funny how it works. Uh, but you learn that just being really sincere and really honest is the absolute key to the whole thing. And, and that's been our recipe for success so far. Uh, hopefully it keeps working. Well, it's interesting you saying that sometimes, you know, a, a client will come back to you or recommend you, even though they didn't, they didn't work with you. What do you think are some of the mistakes that, that, that can kind of uh, dissolve a successful client relationship that architects might make? I think I think that the biggest mistake is again not communicating clearly yeah. about what what things are going to take to do. Um, it, you find that just at the beginning you say it's going to, we think it's going to cost in this range. We think it's going to take this duration, and I think where a lot of architects get themselves into trouble is promising too much, because mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of things that we can do as a profession, but there are a lot of things that are out of our control. Um, we're dealing with uh, uh, with builders that ultimately control the cost of, of projects, and the cost of projects fluctuate. Uh, you know, the things that we use in projects are commodities. 
the cost of lumber goes up, the cost of concrete goes up and down. Um, and when things are really busy, um, the prices are way up. And so these are things that are out of our control. And so the more you prepare people for that, this understanding that, you know, you gave us your, your budget and your timeline and, and we've responded and we've come up with something that should align with that. There are things that are out of your control. And uh, that's, that's hard to convey, especially at the beginning of the job, that there will be uncertainty in these things. You, once you start digging in the ground, there's, you, we do soils reports and things so we know in advance, but once you put that first shovel in the ground, uh, you're at the mercy of the things that you hit in the earth in a lot of ways. And uh, so you, 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 learn, you learn ways to mitigate that risk and to make sure the best you can that things don't come up, but, um, but they will. In construction, it's a, it's a dirty, messy business. There will be issues. There will be things you have to resolve in the field. And so you prepare people for that. You let them know it's coming. You make sure you have the right contingencies to, to deal with it. And the more you do that and the more that your clients see that you're prepared and understand mm-hmm. that, the better off it is. Like we, we run into issues all the time, but our clients are ready for it and we're prepared for it. And, mm-hmm. and so that, that I think is just the key is just getting people prepared for what they're getting into and being really, really honest about what they're getting into. Cause it does take a long time and, and a lot of times cost uh, a fairly sizable investment. Have you ever experimented with differing types of business models? So you were saying earlier that, you know, you've, you've moved in and you, you do work kind of in, 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 a, in a really nice array of different sectors. Have you ever kind of gone into the development side or produced or done kind of turnkey services for clients, particularly in the residential sectors? Or has it always been kind of the traditional design fees um, for architectural services? Most of our work is just traditional fees, um, yeah. but if you want to be successful, you have to be nimble and you yeah. have to recognize opportunities. Um, we have uh, a lot of developers that um, we, we work with a lot that um, you know we're starting to talk to about uh, being a part of the development, um, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a scary thing, uh, but you also know it really well. Uh, and, and so I feel pretty comfortable uh, as we start to look at things uh, on our own because we do that for them. They hire us and they say, figure out if this project would work. And so if we're already doing that analysis, I mean, it, you, you're putting a little skin in the game. But um, we, we try to keep that. Um, and that's pretty minimal so far. Most of it's been just traditional uh, design and architectural services. But it's something that I'm interested in and uh, yeah. wouldn't mind doing more of. Um, it, but yeah, I think it's just being opportunistic and, and knowing that, uh, you can have confidence in the things that you're reviewing for others and that, you know, if it's going to work for them, it'll work if we're involved too. Fantastic. And what's planned for the rest of 2020 is that, is it, can you see an end to this, the, the COVID, if we survive the meteor? <laughs> if we survive the meteor yeah, in November, <laughs> uh, so I don't know a lot, but I know that we will get through this. Uh, And I know that there will be an end to all of this. And uh, I convey that on a weekly basis to my team. It's tough Mm. right now, but we're going to get through it. There are always trying times. There's always a recession. There's always something that's going to come up. You just know that over time, you're going to get through this. And so we will. I I guarantee it. I'm not going to predict when that's going to be because uh, there are people that get paid a lot more and have a lot more research that have been wrong several times in this. But I do know that it it will pass like everything else. Uh, This too shall pass. Um, And we're going to make the most of the situation. We're going to continue to work. We're going to use it as an opportunity to uh, come up with systems that we can take back to the the studio with us. Um, and that's all you can do. And I think that that's not just as uh, an office or a business, that's as a, as a person. And um, we've really, I think, more now than maybe ever realized why it is we have been so successful is the communication and the way that we, we interact with others. Because yeah. right now it's been stressful for everybody. And, 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 mm-hmm. and I think recognizing that 
recognizing that we're all in this together, that clients, contractors, consultants, everyone you deal with at the city, wherever it might be, know that they're in the same spot as you and use that as the common ground to get things done. And, and so we've, we've actually talked about it a lot as a studio, just knowing that people are a little bit on edge and do what you can in that context to, to put, put people at ease, understand that they're having a hard time too. And I think that maybe it's just my advice to people in general right now is, you know, when somebody cuts you off on the road, know that they're stressed out too. Don't overreact to anything because we're all <laughs> together. So, but uh, yeah. Uh, how, 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 how have you been looking after your, your team um, cause obviously this is, it's very easy to, it's, it's, well, it's difficult to know what people are dealing with, um, personally, particularly during this, you know, it's difficult enough to know in normal periods of time, but obviously now people are dealing with all sorts of stuff and it can have a big impact on people's performance and what they're doing. How have you been able to kind of, um, look after your team members whilst everyone's kind of separated and just on a, on a personal level? Well, I think a, a few months ago, we started to realize that um, everyone was much more on edge, including, mm-hmm. you know, me. I, like, I, I realized that the things had started to wear on me, just like everyone else. And, yeah. and so we started talking about it openly as a studio. We, we, we go through and we talk about things um, that are happening. We try not to do on negative things. So um, in the staff meeting this week, we literally did, all right, everyone has to present one life hack, one COVID life hack, something you can do to make your life a little bit better. And, and so people had, you know, wild ideas. And, you know, some people said, well, watch The Office from start to finish on Netflix. It just, it'll take you back to a simpler time. <laughs> and, 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 it, and it's funny because those things kind of work, but it also, it, it, I think it gets everyone realizing, again, we're in it together. Uh, yeah. We're all going through this. And so there's the personal component and letting people know that, um, you know, we're all going through it and this is how we're helping each other. Um, we had with especially some of our uh, our staff that live in the denser parts of the city, younger staff that are living in apartment buildings, they just weren't getting a lot of outside time. So mm-hmm. um, we set up my my yard, my garden area, as we call it, the, the Ox Conference Room East. <laughs> and so uh, we've been doing meetings outside in, in my garden. Uh, and it's, it's funny because you see people that have been, Fantastic. it's not funny, but people that have been locked in an, an apartment and not have a lot of outside time, they show up and you can see it on them that just the wear and tear of it. And after an hour, hour and a half of meeting, just being outside, has, it, you, mm. you see how it changes them. And so we've been doing a lot of that. Um, the other thing that we've focused on a lot the last few weeks it, now that, you know, we've been at this six months and people are working from dining room tables and working in you know, environments that maybe aren't as comfortable, um, we actually sent out a questionnaire. We said, you know, do you have adequate lighting? Do you have a, a good desk chair? Do you have a table that's big enough to, to lay out drawings or to have multiple monitors? And we just, we asked people, you know, do you have the things you need? Um, is your internet stable? And so uh, we're, we, we basically, we, we went through that. We saw what the issues were and they're giving everyone an allowance uh, to, to buy some things for their home office because it, the homes are an extension of our studio now. And so we want people to feel comfortable and feel like they have a good working environment. And so it's little things like that. It's also making time for more personal things. Um, we, we were doing a game night where we played Pictionary through Zoom uh, on, on Friday evenings and you know, have, have, a, have a beer, a glass of wine, which is kind of fun. But um, you also have to realize that we all spend a lot of time staring at our, kind of, at our computer screen and at Zoom meetings right now. And so just knowing that it can't all be Zoom, <laughs> it has to, you have to find other things to do. And, so I think we're going to try to do like a, a socially distanced, uh, like drive-in movie or something where we all go and sit in our cars, but in the same Love area. It. And just, yeah, trying to do fun, trying to keep fun stuff too. And, and keep people interacting because uh, it is a studio, it is a culture, it is a group. You want people seeing each other and talking to each other. Yeah. And so, yeah, 
it's a challenge for us like everybody else, but I think we're doing okay. Amazing. Brian, I think that's a, a great place for us to conclude the conversation there, but so inspiring to hear the, the kind of the humanist, uh, you know, values that you've instilled in your, in your business and your approach to architecture and the kind of mentoring um, and mentoring mode of leadership that you en encompass and have beautifully articulated today. So thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you so much for uh, having me. It was a really fun conversation and I uh, look forward to talking uh, again sometime soon and hopefully maybe seeing you in, in the garden. Yeah. I'm gonna, in I'll, the garden. <laughs> I'll come to the garden. <laughs> yes. When next time you're in LA, you're more than welcome to come to the garden. <laughs> Absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. It was great chatting. And that's a wrap. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.